me again thank Samarth for agreeing to do this. For those of you who don't know Samarth, Samarth is an associate professor here at UVA and is a part of a group and has been working on epidemic modeling for a long time. He's also part of the expeditions program. And today Samarth is going to talk about his work with his colleagues on modeling complex human behaviors. Samarth's interests are in AI and machine learning and by training. So this is a very nice topic. So we look forward to Samarth's presentation. Thanks, Samarth. Great. Thanks, Madhav. So uh, this is work that my colleague Prantapa and I here have been working with uh, some other colleagues at Utrecht University. So Jan de Moy is a PhD student there, and David Dalana is a former PhD student there. He's now a postdoc at Delft. And uh, Brian and Mehdi are faculty at uh, Utrecht. All of us, I guess, work, uh, you know, part of our work is in multi-agent systems and uh, agent-based simulations. And that's what brought us together working on this thing. I'll you know, give more details in a minute. The thing we're working on here is trying to understand what was the effect of all the different interventions that were put in place during the COVID pandemic. So we're looking at Virginia, just as an example. And this is data from uh, Johns Hopkins from their repository. And here you're seeing the uh, confirmed cases and all the different executive orders and interventions that were put in place by the state of Virginia. And there were a whole bunch of them. And this is the early part of the epidemic. So this is 2020, March, April. We're looking at this period up to July, let's say, because after that variant started to appear and we're not modeling that part yet. But here you can see that every week or two weeks, there was something different being put in place. And the epidemic followed some course, it you know, went up and then the first wave ended at sort of the number of cases went down. And so we might wonder, well, how effective were the interventions that were implemented? So this is a counterfactual question. If they had not been implemented, how bad would the epidemic have been? And if fewer were implemented, you know, what was the effect of each of the different things that was put in place? were some interventions more effective than others, right? So those kinds of questions, I think, are interesting to look back on now that we are where we are. And uh, we can also ask, could we have done better, right? So that's more of a, an optimization question saying, with hindsight, you know, now that we've, we can evaluate the effects of these interventions, if we can, maybe there was a better way to do it. But then, you know, the question also arises, what does that mean? What does it mean to be better? Because maybe it's not just about reducing the number of cases, it's also about reducing other kinds of impacts on people, right? So we've started to see uh, studies being done now about, for example, the impact on young children due to missed schooling or economic impacts on, you know, let's say lower income people due to being forced to miss work. Right? So things like that, I think, are, are important questions to ask now. And we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to do better? How do we define that? And how do we try to find policies that could do better? Right? So that's the motivation here. As we know, at least the early part of the epidemic was really driven by uh, uh, human behaviors. Later, you know, vaccinations came in and other kinds of uh, pharmaceutical interventions came in. But especially the early part is driven by behaviors such as, and we can ignore vaccination for now because that was not available in the early part of the epidemic. But it's behaviors such as mask wearing and keeping physical distance when interacting and keeping social distance, meaning changing your routines to, you know, maybe stay home more and things like that. And these behaviors are driven by all kinds of things, right? People assess their risk and they have some beliefs about the efficacy of these behaviors. They do some normative reasoning, like what are they expected to do and what would happen if they don't comply and things like that. Their social influence, people look at what uh, other people are doing and they listen to people in their social network to make their own decisions. Uh, there's also identity expression, for example, political orientation might influence uh, people's behavioral decisions and things like that. And other things, so that's not all there is. And in fact, there are theories about this, right? So theories from public health, like the theory of reasoned action and planned behavior and so forth, this figure is from a, a nice overview article by Montano and Kashik. They're not the originators of the theory of reasoned action and planned behavior. That's Fishbein and Ichek Eisen and people like that. But this article gives a nice overview and they come up with an integrated behavior model. And I'm just showing this 
to show that you know we're aware that there are theories like this, and hopefully our framework can address, can model these kinds of things, but we're not quite there yet. Right? The kinds of things that public health people believe matter are beliefs uh, and evaluations about behaviors and what their outcomes would be, normative beliefs such as what you're expected to do, how motivated you are to comply, uh, what would be the consequences of not complying, and then control beliefs like how effective would your actions be? Do you actually have any control over this phenomenon that's affecting you? Right. So that's sort of our inspiration for the kind of work we're doing, but we're not modeling something that complex yet. So we'll, we'll get to that. Here's our general approach. And uh, this is a figure that will be familiar, at least to several people here. Our goal is to start with very detailed information as far as we can manage. So there's information about the population. So this is essentially a synthetic population that we construct. So there's demographic information, information about people's activities, like their typical daily and weekly activities, the locations that they go to, so geographical information. We're modeling the state of Virginia, so really we're trying to make it as specific to Virginia as possible with information about where work locations and schools and homes and things like that are in Virginia, right? So it's not some stylized place that we're modeling. And then we put it all together to construct this synthetic population where we're trying to model every single person in the region. And we have data about cases and interventions that were done and mobility information from cell phones and things like that. And from that, we're trying to extract the representations that we can compute with using agent-based simulations. So these are the things we've built that I'll talk about. PanSim is a simulator where you can plug in agents with different behavior models, and it will run on a large cluster and try to scale this up to large populations, the simulation. And SimWAPL is a programming library for agent-oriented programming, which I'll describe in a moment. But what we get out of this is simulations where we have models, hopefully relatively complex models of human behavior, and then we can calibrate them, we can evaluate counterfactuals, we can scale up to large populations, and so forth. So those are sort of the contributions of this work. So brief aside to introduce this idea of the kinds of behavior models we're building. So in uh, computer science, in the field of agents and multi-agent systems, there's this idea of what an agent is. It's called the belief, desire, intention model. And uh, this was uh, based on the work of this philosopher, Michael Batman, who has written extensively about the idea of agency. These are just like three of his books. The classic one is called Intentions, Plans, and Practical Reason, where he presented what's called the planning theory of agency. And the idea really is that agency of a person or an entity lies in its ability to plan to achieve the goals that it wants. So it has some beliefs about the world and it has some uh, desires, which are you know, the kinds of things it would like to see in the world, the states uh, it would like to see in the world. And intentions are some you know, selection goals. You might have multiple goals or multiple desires. You choose to focus on some of them those are called your intentions. This is what I intend to achieve. And then you have to come up with a plan. And your ability to come up with effective plans to achieve your intentions, given your beliefs, that is what agency is, according to Michael Brackman. And uh, this idea was formalized in computer science into this BDI model of agents. So when people were thinking, I guess this is early 90s, about what does it mean for a computer program to be an agent? Uh, they came up with this model based on the planning theory of agency, which is that an agent is a computer program, but it's not a fixed program in the sense that uh, it's just a procedure. It is uh, adaptive somehow. It is trying to do its own thing. It's achieve its own goals. And its agency is with respect to some environment because it is situated in some environment. So, uh, for example, it might need to be able to sense the kind of information that's present in that environment. Without that, it might not have much agency. So this being situated matters. And this BDI is a formal, this is what they like to say, it's a formalization of common folk psychology concepts. So it's not really based in uh, scientific theories of psychology or cognitive science. It's really this sort of philosophical theory of what agency is. And what an agent does is that it tries to find a plan that given its current beliefs about the environment, will help it to achieve its goals. 
And an agent is flexible and autonomous, which allows it to work in dynamic environments. So this is the BDI model of agents. It's been studied, extended over a number of years. And recently, relatively recently, it started to make its way into agent-based simulations. So what we're trying to do here uh, is that build these agent-based simulations that have BDI agents, because hopefully then using this formalism, we can better represent the kinds of behaviors that people do in response to a shock like COVID. So over the last, I would say, 10 or 15 years, this agent-oriented programming formalism has emerged. So just like we have object-oriented programming in computer science, where you have objects and you define your methods and data in terms of objects and their interactions, there is an agent-oriented programming idea which offers support for designing agents where agents, you know, just like you can specify data and methods in object, you can specify beliefs and desires and intentions and provide support for planning and so forth. And there are multiple frameworks for doing agent-oriented programming. One of these developed by our colleague, Mehdi Dastani and others at Utrecht is called double APL. So two APL is double APL. And originally, the, you know, the, all these frameworks came from uh, sort of a logical formalism. So beliefs were represented using formal logic and so were goals and plans and so forth. But it's been generalized quite a bit. So for example, double APL is, you know, written straightforwardly in object-oriented Java. And an agent here is specified as follows. The agent has a belief base, a goal base, and also a plan base. So it tries to figure out, these are pre-specified plans, but what the agent has to do is figure out which plans are applicable in the current context, meaning with its beliefs about the current state of the world, and which goals can be satisfied with the beliefs and the plans that are available. And then there might be some you know, preferences among the goals that can be satisfied. And so it chooses one and then tries to implement that plan. And so double APL provides basically the infrastructure needed to implement these kinds of programs. It is not, however, written for with the idea of developing simulations. So they made some modifications to it, which I'll describe presently. But here's the simulator that we have built, and Paranthpa is really the designer of this. So PANSIM is the pandemic simulator. And so it's a distributed agent-based framework. It is a discrete time simulator. So we assume, for example, that uh, we're modeling one day at a time. That's one tick, let's say. And it runs on distributed memory clusters. The thing about Tansim is that it is meant to be able to plug in agent complex agent models. So if you have a program to model a single agent, we can plug this into Tansim and we can replicate it many times to model millions of agents and uh, compute the interactions between them. So what it does is basically it simulates two contagions on top of a dynamic contact network. The contact network comes from the synthetic population, so people during the course of their activities, go to various locations. There might be other people at the same locations, and so they might come into contact, and that defines a kind of dynamic contact network. And then we simulate two contagions on top of this dynamic contact network. There's a disease contagion, which is an uh, SIR-like model. Uh, I'll describe it briefly, but it is specified declaratively. So we have a simple domain-specific language for specifying contagions that Pansom can read, and it can compute the progression of the disease, the transmission of the disease, whenever there are interactions between agents. The other is a behavior contagion, and it doesn't have to be a contagion. It's simply a behavior model, which is what the agent does with the information that it has. So it can make observations you know, when people go to locations, and it can also, it is also aware of the norms or the interventions that are in place, and it can choose to comply or not. And also it can update its own internal state based on the information provided by the environment and make decisions based on its current internal state. For example, if an agent is symptomatic, it may choose to not do its typical daily activities. But the, all that can be plugged in to Pansen. And what we're using here, it doesn't have to be, but what we're using here is this BDI-based behavior model written using an extension of double API. So what Pansom does is it has an agent model and a location model. So locations get distributed over the cluster and uh, the social interactions are computed within locations. 
then the information from the interactions is communicated back to the agent model where the agent can update its decisions. It can also update its own disease state based on, uh, let's say, how long it has been infectious or something like that. And that disease transmission module then tells you whether the disease was passed on to somebody else or not. Okay. So the way it's implemented is that we have this agent to location bipartite graphs, which is partitioned across ranks. So across different cores in the cluster, for example, or different nodes and cores in the cluster. And uh, it is a bulk synchronous parallel design, which means that some locations are assigned to certain cores and that is fixed. It may be predetermined and they do their computations, but then at some point they have to synchronize. Right? So each time step or each super step in this uh, design consists of multiple phases that I described here. So for example, agents have to make their decisions about what activity they're going to do next. They go to those locations and uh, there's some parallelism that can be exploited here because if an agent is going to go to multiple locations in the same day, because the incubation period is, is long enough that if you get exposed in the morning, you're not going to infect somebody else in the afternoon, we can actually compute those visits during a single day, the visits and interactions in parallel, right? So that's something that can be exploited in, uh, to speed up the simulations here. There's a social interaction phase, which is at each location, we have to figure out who is interacting with whom. So who's there at the same time as somebody else. And this can change as the simulation progresses because agents can choose to do certain activities or not do them. So we compute what interactions are going to happen and then whether any disease transmission happens. So if there's an infectious person there who comes into contact with a susceptible person, then with some, some probability, the disease might be transmitted. So that gets computed. So sorry, after phase one, there's some synchronization to make sure that people arrive at the locations correctly. And after disease transmission, there's synchronization again, so that each agent can update its disease state correctly. After they do that, they might update their beliefs about the state of the world, such as did they see other people wearing masks? How many people did they see? So are people social distancing? How many people seem symptomatic? And those kinds of beliefs go into the belief base of the agent. Those are updated, and then the agent must make a new decision. Right? So basically, there are five phases here and two synchronization points. Sim double APL, which is an extension of double APL to support social simulations, basically has to be able to work with time step simulations like we have. And so the idea here is that the agent chooses an action, but the action is, so to speak, materialized, it's, it's made to happen by the environment instead of the agent performing the action directly. And the agents have to be synchronized to the environment and to each other. That happens at the synchronization steps. And then it's repeatability and reproducibility are important just as general principles from simulations. So we have to be able to take random seeds and things like that. So that's sim double APL. Now to construct a simulation, so, you know, our, our computer science motivation is to be able to build large scale simulations with BDI agents. But our goal here with respect to the actual project is to build a COVID-19 simulation. So we start with a synthetic population of Virginia, as I already described, it's got typical weekly activity patterns and it's got uh, demographics and locations and uh, some other geographical information and so forth. We also have mobility data from Cubic. So as many of you might know, Cubic had shared some data with several universities and other partners, which has uh, things from cell phones. So it's telling us about the locations of people and it's sort of sampled uh, at some rate, it's not a steady rate. And it has maybe three to 5% of the population that are represented in that data set. And the data we got from Cubic is for the first six months of 2020. They had also shared some other data, but that this is the data set that we're working with. And uh, in uh, the first two months of, of 2020, there was no real change to the mobility patterns. And you can see here, these are from uh, some of the counties in Virginia and it is showing uh, the average radius of gyration for the county. So if a person you know, has pings at several different locations during the course of the day, we compute the radius of gyration from that for each person. 
and then we average it for the county, and that's what's being plotted here. And you see that there's some sort of regularity that's kind of a weekly pattern. Every day tends to be a little bit different, but there are some sort of rough weekly patterns here. And there's not much change if you look at the average here until about mid-March. Mid-March is when the first executive orders were put into place to try to limit people's mobility. And you should see an immediate effect. Mobility drops quite sharply. And then it started to come back up. And in many places, by the end of June, it was actually back to what it had been in January and February, sometimes even a bit higher, which may just represent some you know, seasonal differences in mobility. People get out and about more in the summer than in the winter. But uh, this is very useful to try to understand how people change their activity patterns during this period that we're studying. So we have this data for the whole US. We're focusing on uh, certain counties in Virginia just to be able to build this model. And we're trying to calibrate to this mobility data to uh, fit our behavior model. We also have COVID-19 case data, but in this case, since we're not modeling things like testing, we actually use uh, estimates of the true number of infections. So we're trying to fit to the estimates of true number of infections. In this case, this is from this site called COVID-19 projections. I think there are other estimates also. And then we have data about the executive orders that were put into place. We simplified it a little bit just because every executive order said sort of multiple things. We tried to simplify it to pull out the relevant information. And so things like you allow masking and allow teleworking and when schools are closed, K through 12, when K through 12 and higher education was closed, limit public spaces to small groups, close businesses, reduce their capacity, ask people to stay at home. There are all kinds of things here. And there are dates when they were put into place and when they were lifted. So it's a, actually a fairly complex set of interventions that were put in place. And then finally, we have disease parameters. So we have, for example, age stratified susceptibility from the literature. We also have a bunch of other disease parameters, such as the relative infectiousness of asymptomatic people, and uh, the effectiveness of wearing masks and so forth. We tried to get from the literature as much as possible. Uh, the only thing we ended up calibrating was the infectivity of symptomatic and asymptomatic people. And you can see the result from this that, at least in our model, asymptomatic people have uh, maybe, I would say 60% of the infectivity of symptomatic people. That's just how it turned out in our model. So here's what the agents actually do when they have to decide whether they're going, they're going to do a particular activity or not. So we tried to set this up very simply instead of making like a very complicated agent model to, just to start with. We assume that agents have their weekly activity schedules, which is provided by the synthetic population. And uh, their goals are simply to continue with these. They're not trying to do anything other than that, just go about their daily lives. And so, that's what their goal base is, uh, just their normal weekly activities. And uh, what they have to reason about is, given their beliefs about the world and their goals, is it achievable or should they do this or not? Right? So there are some interventions which are compulsory and some which are not. And they can choose to comply with them, even if they are com compulsory. But in some cases, they don't have a choice. For example, if a school is closed, you don't have the choice to go to a school. If the intervention is that facial masks are compulsory, you can still choose not to comply, right? And in fact, there weren't many sanctions. So uh, really it comes down to how much you feel like complying. How do they make these decisions? It's based on their own trust. We introduced a trust variable, which is sort of meant to encompass many things, like how effective do you think this intervention would be? And uh, you know, do you have some trust in the government, let's say, uh, in following this? It may be some expression of your identity and so forth. Just to keep it simple, we have one tunable trust parameter. But we can also have the agents copy the past behaviors of uh, themselves and others. So if they go to a location, if they've been there in the past, they have some idea about how many other people were there, how many people were doing things like wearing facial masks and so forth, and they can base their own behavior on that. So combining these things, they make their own decisions about their activities, whether they're going to do an activity or not, 
and how they're going to do it. And maybe if not, they just stay home. And uh, so that's you know shown here as a simple so chart also. So this is the BDI part of the aging behavior. Okay. Then we calibrate it, we use uh, Bayesian optimization and we do an alternating calibration. So just to limit the number of parameters that have to be calibrated in each step. So we calibrate the behavior parameters to the mobility data to try to match the drop in people's movements and then the subsequent slow increase again. And then we calibrate the disease parameters to the projected or estimated number of uh, true cases. So our objective function in this case is just root, uh, root mean squared error between the two. And we use a Bayesian optimization to come up with the points to test. So we run the simulation for those selected parameters, and then we update the Bayesian model, and then we have it suggest new points in the parameter space to try out. And we do fairly well here, as you can see from these plots, that the simulated and the real data, or in this case, estimated number of cases, are not too far off. I think that's pretty reasonable. We are also able to capture some of the differences in the mobility between different counties. So people in every country didn't respond with the same level of reduction of mobility that they had in that period. And so we are able to show some of those differences just naturally from the detailed synthetic population data we have and this calibration process. And then scaling. So one of the things we looked at was how large a population can we simulate with this TANSIM simulator coupled with these sort of relatively heavy agent models, the BDI models. And we are able to show some strong scaling and weak scaling both. So strong scaling is we're keeping the problem size fixed and we're increasing the computational resources. And we see this uh, reduction in runtime. So we have different lines for the different counties here. And we show you know, reasonable reductions in all the cases. Note that the scale is actually log log. So it's not a linear drop, which would be fantastic, but still we're able to scale up to relatively large sizes. This dot here on the far right, these two are for the full population of Virginia, which is close to 8 million agents. So we can get up to reasonable sizes, but practically for doing the calibration and everything in reasonable amounts of time, we were working with the, I think, population of 12 counties. Okay. So ultimately, what did we get? This is the sort of the counterfactual experiment to try to figure out how good were these executive orders that were put into place, how effective were each of them. And the way we did it was uh, we have condensed it to basically nine executive orders. Each of them do multiple things as shown in the table over here. So for example, the first executive order said facial masks are encouraged and teleworking is encouraged, right? So it's two sort of normative things at the same time. And what we did was we said, OK, if there were none, if no executive orders were put in place, we can still use the calibrated disease model and also the behavior model, where the behaviors are pretty simple. There are no norms or orders to comply with, so people can basically go about their normal activities. And we can see how bad the epidemic would have been. Right? So we get quite a large outbreak, and we call that zero. So basically, all the other interventions will have some improvement over this. So this is our baseline, right? And then we implement them in order. So if only executive order one was implemented and it was stopped where it was stopped, how much better would, were we? And so this shows that the difference with respect to E0 was that there was a 26.33% drop in cases according to our model. And then we say, if order one and order two were implemented, exactly as they were in the real world with the same schedule, what would be the difference? So an overall drop in that case of 68% in the number of cases, and with respect to the having only executive order one, there's a drop of 56.5%. So we can go down the list and we can keep adding on the executive orders that were implemented and seeing what was the incremental benefit of each one, right? And it turns out that they're, at least in our model, they are generally very helpful, right? And overall, there's a reduction of over 93% in the number of cases that we would have seen otherwise. Um, but there are a couple that actually maybe we could have done without. So this executive order three keeps groups small and it said allow a maximum of 100 people in public spaces. Maybe that did nothing. 
right? In fact, there was a slight increase in the number of cases in our simulation. And then executive order eight, which said facial mask required, but it was fairly late in the summer that this one was sort of re-implemented. That didn't do very much. By then people were already increasing their mobility and maybe they, not a lot of people chose to comply with that because perhaps cases had started to fall, but that actually made things worse, right? So it's not saying that you shouldn't have facial mask required. What it's saying is that implementing it at that time didn't really have much of a positive impact on reducing cases. Yeah. And that's, you know, this is just from our simple simulation. Of course, if we have a more complex behavior model or, you know, improved calibration or something, those things could change. So these are just preliminary results from uh, our ongoing work. But it is useful to see that overall, there was a huge drop in the number of cases by implementing all of these different executive orders. And this plot on the top with the lines here, uh, this shows when they were implemented. So for example, this facial mask required was implemented pretty late. So that's the counterfactual experiment. It's trying to estimate what was the benefit of these interventions. The other thing we can try to do is see if we can find better policies. So in this case, like I said, it's not just about preventing the number of infections or reducing it, the number of infections as much as possible, but there's also some kind of cost associated with these interventions. And so we can try to formalize that because we can use the simulation itself to figure out how many people are impacted by each intervention. So for example, if you say schools have to be closed, how many people are impacted by that? And the, certainly the students who have to go to the school are impacted. But maybe there's also a, a much bigger weight to that because one, it also affects other people in the population, like uh, their parents. And also it has a long-term impact due to missed education or missed nutritional opportunities or various things. So you can assign a weight to that and you have to choose what the weight will be. Maybe there are ways to assign that based on uh, economic analysis or other things. So there's the number of infections in the objective function plus the cost of each intervention and the weight that you choose to assign to those interventions based on what you perceive their impact to be. And you can take this now objective function, which has both infections and the cost of the interventions, and you can try to optimize this once you have a fitted model in the simulation about you know, how people respond behaviorally. We've been doing that, and these are some preliminary results. So for example, we can try to punish some interventions more than others in the sense that we think they have a bigger impact and we try to avoid them. So for example, if we want to keep the economy going, right, we assign a higher relative weight to business closure. We, we want to avoid that. And you can find policies that reduce the business closure quite a bit. So here it says keep people in small groups and close schools and so forth, but you can delay and reduce the level of business closure quite a bit without incurring a huge cost in terms of number of infections. We also tried keeping the schools open, which so far hasn't worked well. So you can see that despite our effort to do that, it's still saying the best thing to do is keep the schools closed. But in terms of finding a policy that does it, it may simply be a matter of penalizing that enough. So this is ongoing work. Uh, we're still trying to figure out uh, the best way to do these optimization or search for effective policies. The other things we're working on are improving the calibration and optimization. So uh, we're using Bayesian optimization in sort of standard ways with the Gaussian process models. But it turns out that for our particular case, we can use better models, which reduce the search substantially and uh, allow much better fitting to the cost surface. We are also working on improving the behavior models. Like I said, we have relatively simple things right now where people are just trying to continue with their activities and try to comply with interventions based on a single parameter called trust. But in fact, we know that there are many other things that affect people's behaviors. And uh, there are very nice surveys that exist about people's attitudes and their choices, even in the early part of the epidemic. So one goal we have is to improve the behavior models by bringing in better data about people's attitudes and choices. And then finally, we are interested in finding more equitable interventions. So we can use this framework to have notions of fairness or equitability of interventions because, for example, a business closure doesn't impact everybody in the same way. Some people are able to work from home if they have those kinds of jobs. 
Some people aren't. Some people have enough money in the bank to be able to, you know, write out some disruption to their income, and some people don't. And so uh, finding interventions that are more equitable while also reducing the number of uh, infections as much as possible is one thing we can try to tackle with this kind of framework. So that's all I have for today. Thank you. And uh, thank you for taking the time to listen. There's a couple of questions in the chat, so why don't we start there, Samartha. Mallory asks, are there any adjustments for missing agents in the mobility data? Thinking about children who likely wouldn't be represented by mobile phone data. Right. So, so far, we haven't made those kinds of adjustments. That's a very fair question. I think that children typically, you know, they go on school buses, for example, but other than that, typically children don't travel by themselves. So if there are things that affect children's mobility, it generally shows up in the mobility patterns of adults also. That's at least our sort of basic justification for not trying to adjust for that right now. And the other thing is that the data we have don't have any demographics, right? So the cell phone pings are literally an ID of a phone and a latitude longitude pair. And so we don't want to try to infer too much from that. We're just simply saying, we'll just aggregate it and find the radius of gyration and work with that rather than trying to do things like infer who might have a child or not, or what the ages of these people might be and uh, whether it's a fair representation of the population or not, because it clearly isn't, right? Not everybody has a cell phone. It varies by age, by income, all kinds of things. We haven't tried to adjust for any of those things yet. We'll go to the next question in the chat from Jose. Did you implement a case when mask mandates were required earlier? And is there a date when, according to your model, masks actually make a positive contribution to reduction of cases? So the way we do the optimization right now, when we're doing the policy optimization, the way we're doing it right now, and it doesn't have to be done this way, but the way we're doing it right now is we say, let's say we have the same set of executive orders, but we decided to implement them at different times. So we can change the start date of these executive orders and we can change the duration for which it's applied. That's our optimization space. What's the best option, right? So that allows mask mandate to be put in, let's say right at the beginning and kept up for the whole duration of the simulation. That policy exists within a space. So for example, in this one, puts an alarm mask much earlier. In this one, where we're trying to keep the economy going, somehow an employee's mask is actually quite late. So it is possible to have policies that have mask mandates early and they will be effective. At least that's the way our model is set up that wearing a mask actually reduces your probability of getting infected. And it's in the policy space. So it's a matter of figuring out in which cases that matters and in which cases other things matter. I see Mallory, I think you had a follow-up question. I guess this is kind of on Related to that point about the employee's mask policy and the keeping the economy going, optimization is the idea that like businesses might also be closing, not directly because of the policy, but because either too many employees are testing out sick or the virus is running rampant through the community and people just aren't going out and making purchases. So I was wondering if that is something that you could include in the model and whether you think that might affect the results. Yeah, so that can be included. When we say keep the economy going, we're not actually measuring anything about economic activity here. All we're saying is that try to reduce the business closures, the mandated business closures. So it may well be that businesses are allowed to be open, but people choose not to go there because they're looking at each other and saying, oh, nobody's going out and about, so we're not going to do that. In which case, economic activity does go down, but that's... All we're trying to do is not mandate business closures in this model so far. You could, of course, try to make it more complex so that you try to find ways in which people don't have to reduce their visits to businesses, but still there's not much of an increase in the number of cases and so forth. That's sort of outside the scope of what we've done. It could, in principle, be done here, but we haven't tried to go in that direction. Um, I think Anil was next. So much, very nice talk. So for these uh, executive orders or other interventions, 
Uh, how do you model compliance? So is there data that you're calibrating that? or? Yeah, we are only calibrating to the mobility data to model the level of compliance. And we've tried to keep the model relatively simple. There's a simple parameter called trust, right? And we actually initialized it just to have some difference between the counties. We initialized it based on uh, voting records. But that's actually not very relevant. But the point is that there is a trust parameter that can dictate their likelihood of compliance. There's a fatigue factor, which determines sort of a decay in trust over time. So you might be very motivated to comply in the beginning and then it sort of decays over time. And these two parameters are calibrated. And then the other thing is uh, that people make their decisions based on looking at the behavior of other people. So there can be a bit of a behavior contagion where based on a previous visit to the location, they have an observation of how many people were there, how many were masking, how many were doing physical distancing and so forth. And those go into their own decisions about what to do next. So this factor affects compliance to all the interventions. That's right. Okay, thanks. And it's just to keep the model simple because otherwise you can soon start to overfit, I think. We had another question in the chat from Don Burke. Is it correct that the behavioral contagion here was transmitted by physical proximity in the synthetic population? And did you try to model long distance behavioral contagion by social media? Yeah, so we have thought about it a lot. We haven't brought in any social media data or things like social networks. So for example, people have friends and they may not always live the same locations, but they talk to each other. It doesn't have to be over social media. So we haven't brought in that kind of social influence yet, but that's definitely something we would be interested in doing. The key is, I think, to find the right kind of data so that we can rigorously put it into a synthetic population which models interactions as well as a behavior model. I think that's a very, very tricky question, and uh, I don't think I have quite an idea about the right way to go about it, so we haven't done that yet. But it is important. I completely agree. So a question from Dave Higgin. So Mark, thanks for the talk. I enjoyed it. Art, you talked some about, so there's parameters that are kind of involved in the calibration. And I'm curious, like, okay, I know this is sort of a starting point and it's, uh, it's impressive it's gotten this far. So, so I'm curious in thinking about, um, as you're looking towards the future, I know there's gonna be things about either behaviors or about the populations or interactions that you feel are probably important drivers, but it's hard to know what they are, right? So we wanna treat those as uncertain. Maybe the data can help uh, help us inform us on, on what these things are. You know, if you had to uh, pick a few things that you thought might be uh, really important types of uncertainty or calibrations to get into sort of the next version of this, what, what would you pick? One thing I'm really interested in is how people respond to these kinds of normative dictates or interventions. So part of it is that uh, people have to identify, first of all, what is expected of them, right? So that's part of what uh, normative behavior involves. So it's one thing if you know what the norm is and all you're doing is trying to decide whether to comply or not, that might be driven by some idea about sanctions or something like that or how desperate you are to do something. But first you have to even figure out what is expected of you, right? So there are injunctive norms. The governor says everybody should wear masks, right? Or the president says that or somebody, right? You're being told this is expected of you and you have to decide whether to do it or not. And then there are descriptive norms, which is what do you see other people doing around? And if uh, maybe everybody's ignoring it and not wearing masks, you think, oh, maybe I shouldn't do it either. So that's a descriptive norm. and how do people gather this kind of information and how does the sort of trade-off between injunctive and descriptive norms happen? That is very interesting to me. And I think with COVID it was especially interesting because in the early part of the epidemic, when you see these uh, people saying that you should wear a mask and so forth, that's an injunctive norm for which there wasn't a descriptive norm yet. It wasn't in the US for example, we had no history of wearing masks or something like that in response to an epidemic. People do it in other countries, it's quite common, but in the US, it's just, we didn't know what to do. And so there was a period of time when people tried to comply with the injunctions and then you see the shape of this curve, it drops and then it rises from the mobility data. It's the same thing everywhere. It turns out the shape of this curve is pretty universal. 
in every state and you know every county it has the same shape and why is that i think it has to do with this play off of uh, injunctive and descriptive norms so formalizing that and figuring out how to understand the uncertainty or sensitivity with respect to that kind of norm formation and norm compliance that to me is a very interesting direction to go nice thanks i just want to i put a note in the chat more for so piggybacking on your work not mm-hmm. directly related but uh, and ben and erin should speak up too but we with our undergraduates here we have just about finished a rather large effort to collect what was a reasonably available set of all the interventions that were put in place in our state over, over the last two years county by county and it's a significant effort but something that your models could potentially use uh, later on but others i wanted to bring it up because we have a large number of folks in the call today so they they know about it and we'll talk about it in a few months but i just want to let folks know that there's an effort i'm going quite that's really, yeah that's really great that'd be very useful because you know here we're just modeling the state level interventions but there were many at local level county level university level things like that that were done school districts and so forth they have a lot of local authority to implement or not implement certain interventions so and that probably affected people's behaviors maybe even more than the state level ones so that would be very useful right i think if you recall we had started an effort with stanford but but this is another attempt to do it slightly differently uh, and maybe in a few months we can talk ben can probably give a talk on this uh, anil did you have another follow up question yeah so related to this last point what kind of data would allow this kind of figuring out what type it is and at what stage it is uh, so like we've been looking at delphi facebook survey and uh, when you look at rates uh, mask wearing vaccination they vary quite a bit over time over uh, space and so on uh, we looked at some polarization indices they also vary quite a bit so i'm curious from that Uh, is there a way to say in this phase so let's say maybe with respect to mask wearing there was i know injunctive but with respect to vaccination that's something else and so on right that's a great question and i, I don't have an answer but yeah yeah, I'll I'll yeah. Okay. maybe one last one trying to pick it back on this nice talk someone gave but thank parantap as well i know he has done a lot of work and uh, i appreciate the work you folks have done and again this is because we have other people folks on the call uh, is one paper that uh, we have written with folks here and folks at, at Princeton and Simon Avinash and and folks in Sweden as well as Cornell on the joint contagion between mask wearing and disease transmission we just got it accepted at PNAS once it's official we'll accept a draft and we can talk about it but it has these two contagions we it's a very narrow problem small problem within the domain summer you have but it certainly can use a model modeling framework like the one you presented today that's great yeah i'd love to see it since we do have a few minutes uh, we have a question from sylvia hi i'm just surprised i was surprised at the beginning of the talk and now that i stare at the data i'm even more surprised about the cubic mobility data and i was wondering if i was the if i were the only person in this audience that didn't feel that that was realistic that mm-hmm. the mobility was back to where in at the end of june maybe the deviation is so small that my strange and wonderful experience is is in that little bit of noise but it just doesn't it's not what i remember of june 2020 that uh, that is however what the data show it yeah no that's really what the data show i can yeah uh, i understand that it's just very strange we've, to uh, me we've looked at not just cubic but there you know there are other providers of uh, the cell phone based location data so we've looked at multiple thank you thank same. you it's just it was just just feels it just felt strange that's all no i i completely understand and uh, there are two things one we've confirmed this from multiple data sets and two it went up but then it went down again also when the next wave came along so i think this increase in mobility also coincided with the subsiding of the first wave and then you know there were several executive orders that were relaxed at this time so it coincided with those things and then the next wave started and you know more executive orders and other interventions were put in mobility went down again and 
Some parts of the world, there were strict sanctions and you can see the response to that. So I think this is real. I, I believe it's real data. I just was trying to figure out if anybody else had this same, had the same perception. The data, first of all, there's other noise in it. But one interesting issue to remember is that mobility doesn't mean the same before and after. And there are a couple of interesting examples that people have come up with. For instance, if you go to grocery to just pick up your bags from outside and come back, you still get counted in this, but it's not the same level of social interaction. Or if you go to a restaurant and pick up your stuff, but I just thought I'd give Q Samar because I know he and me have talked and you should answer this. I'm giving you another reason. Yeah, exactly. I think that just because people are moving around doesn't mean that the level of interactions are the same. And it is the interactions that determine the spread of the disease. Also, if people are moving around, maybe it's because they're wearing masks and they feel a bit safer and that can uh, lead to an increase in mobility. There are also very clear signals in the mobility. You can tell what's happening, like when universities reopened in the fall and all the students came back, there were clear bumps in mobility followed by bumps in cases in many, many different universities. We looked at that closely and we just got a paper in about that. So. Uh, the mobility patterns are a useful signal of the number of interactions and potentially the number of cases that are going to happen, but they're certainly not perfectly predictive. Since we are at our 12.30 end time, I'm gonna thank um, everyone for attending today. Thanks, Martha, for, for a wonderful talk. So thanks everybody for attending today. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much, great talk.